Welcome and thank you for joining us for the webinar hosted by Global Health Technologies Coalition and the Council on Health Research for Development. Um, this is the third in a series of educational webinars that they've been, we've been convening um, regarding the um, financing and coordination of global health R&D. My name is Claire Wingfield and I'll be your moderator today. I am the Product Development Policy Officer at PATH, an international NGO headquartered in the United States and for almost 40 years we've been developing global health technologies in partnership with the public, private, academic sectors uh, across drugs, diagnostics, vaccines and devices. Um, so we have, I, I will though be not wearing my PATH hat today, I will be wearing my GHTC membership hat as your moderator. Um, the Global Health Technologies Coalition is a nonprofit uh, organization that is actually a group of more than 25 nonprofits from uh, product development partnerships, from think tanks, from implementing organizations, from advocacy organizations dedicated to accelerating research and development for global health R&D. So, um, I, we also, before we get started, want to thank our event co-hosts, the Council on Health Research for Development, also known as CoRED, uh, for hosting us in their offices here in Geneva. Uh, we're here today specifically to discuss um, the current R&D system approaches to global health R&D. There has been a lot of uh, discussion about not just the development of technologies, but how are we getting these technologies to those who need them most. Um, and so we have a, today a leading panel of experts who are going to discuss what works and what doesn't in our current system and propose some potential solutions for how we can not only accelerate the development of new tools, but that we can also ensure that there's access to these tools. So um, we're going to begin today's discussion. I'm going to ask each of our panelists for uh, an opening question. Um, and then we are going to have a bit of q and A. I'm encouraging the panelists to question each other. Um, and I no doubt have a stack of questions that I could ask. But we do want to make sure that you, the audience, both online and in the room, have a chance to ask questions of the panelists. Uh, so for those of you who are here in person, you can, you've been given note cards that you can write your question down. We'd ask that you also add your name and organization um, to that. And then for those of you online, you can submit a question via the web platform at any point during the session. I do want to warn you that we will likely only get to a fraction of the questions asked but they will be um, kept and included in a final meeting report. So they will at least be held so that people can reference them. So I really do encourage you to ask any and all questions that you may have. Guaranteed, there are plenty more people out there who are wondering the same thing as you. Um, so let me turn to the panel. I'll give a brief introduction <laughs> of each of our, our panelists. Um, to my right, we have Jan Arn Rodingen, who is the uh, Director of Division of Infectious Disease Control at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health and is the former co-chair of the WHO Consultative Expert Working Group, also known as the CEWG, um, on Global Health R&D. We have George Jacau, who is the Executive Vice President of Access and Product Management at the Medicines for Malaria Ventures, and as you can guess, the name suggests, they develop new medicines for malaria. Um, and Dr. Denis Braun, who is the Global Director for Access and Public Affairs at the end of the table um, at, at pharmaceutical company CIPLA, and he's the former Executive Director of UnitAid. Um, and then finally, we have Dr. Manika Balasagram, um, Executive Director of the Access Campaign at Medicine Sans Frontiers, better known as MSF, MSF to some of you. So, to not waste any time, I want to, um, you know, Yadarn, the CEWG released a report um, that was really the culmination of a decade of discussions that had been happening about how to improve the coordination and financing of global health R&D, and it included a, lot of, a number of proposals and recommendations for how to do just that. Um, can you give us an overview, in for setting the scene, give us an overview of the work of the CEWG, the recommendations that were included, and then what's the status moving forward of getting these recommendations taken up? Yeah, pleased to do so, and thanks. Clear. Um, so as described, CWG was an expert group at the World Health Organization. So um, I'm very thankful for both the Global Health Technology Coalition and uh, CORED for organizing this meeting. 
Um, the expert group was really a way to try to distill all the kind of thinking and knowledge that had been put into the efforts on uh, how we can improve the, the global R&D and innovation system for securing both innovation and access to new medical technologies for those in need. Uh, so what I will um, discuss is really kind of uh, start with a very basic model and that is the, the current business model of innovation and access of new medicines as an example but it can be any technology. Uh, we have a public health need, that's the marketplace. And that kind of marketplace more or less directs the, and gives some incentives to R&D. And now I'm talking about incentives, in the, so R&D done in the private sector. Um, and that's the way the, uh, the business model develops. So meaning that the market has an ability to pay for future products and that gives the strong incentive for private investors to actually invest in the long-term efforts of developing new technologies, new medicines. If we have a high or a big market, there will be a stronger signal for investing, meaning that there will be more investments in R&D. The other challenge then is that if we have a very poor uh, market from a business perspective, small commercial markets, small incentives, there will be less R&D. And that's very strongly documented for many, many years, as you know, all know. And that means that the public health needs will not be fully met. And that's the key challenge in this system. And then we, um, we have two kind of different approaches to how to correct those imbalances. Uh, one is that if there is a large public health need, but it's really not met by a similar uh, purchasing power uh, in those markets. Uh, so that's, it's an imbalance between the purchasing power and the public health need. As I said, if we only base the innovation uh, system on the purchasing power in the market, there will be too little innovation, too little research and development. So we need to add uh, incentives or investments directly in the innovation market and separate it as a, as a, a, a specific marketplace in its own right, uh, where you actually incentivize and pay for innovations in a different way. And that's the concept of delinkage. Uh, so many ways you are relying on both a functioning market for innovations and a separate market for productions and sales, which is different from the current business model that combine those in one mechanism. So that will mean that, oh sorry, uh, by that giving incentives and mechanisms both in at some in the marketplace, in the, in the public health market, but also directly in for innovations by milestone prices or by other mechanisms to incentivize innovation, you can boost R&D. The other way to think about this is by some means of market shaping. By, in many ways, expand market above the, the real purchasing power in the communities uh, that are in need. So in many ways, you add on some sort of subsidies or mechanisms in the marketplace, um, which will also expand and increase incentives for innovation. Those are, in many ways, the two different principles and ideas on how we can correct and do something about the innovation and system. Um, we can also translate these into uh, kind of the linkage, uh, which is first and foremost push mechanisms, how we can, through financing innovation directly or incentivizing innovation directly, through uh, more collaborative approaches, open knowledge innovation, through making incentives through milestone and end prices, um, we can uh, kind of handle the innovation process first and foremost maybe from the, the, the upstream uh, side, uh, but we also can utilize pool mechanisms which would be more of the market shaping uh, uh, kind of principle I, I just shared. Uh, so as has been alluded to, the, the CEWG uh, was really just uh, one part of a large process. It started off with the Commission on Intellectual Property Rights and uh, Innovation and Public Health, uh, which was started up in 2003 uh, and concluded in 2006. There were a long negotiation process, two and a half, three years at the World Health Organization through the so-called IGWIG. It concluded with a global strategy and plan of action in 2008, or actually formally in 2009. Um, 
one of the recommendations in that global strategy and plan of action was that because the negotiation process had not really solved and cracked the issues of financing and coordination of R&D, there was an appointment of an expert group that should look into all kind of proposals and ideas in that space. That expert group developed a report uh, which was sent to the World Health Assembly for different reasons I would not go into today. That was not kind of endorsed or welcomed by the World Health Assembly and the World Health Assembly asked for another expert group, the, the so-called consultative expert working group. Um, we then delivered our report in 2012 uh, which has, is uh, still kind of, it was welcomed by the World Health Assembly, but it was of course not adopted as such. Uh, and I will just briefly say something about some of the developments at the WHO uh, after that uh, report's recommendation. Oh. Yeah. So in 2003, there was an agreement to establish a global health R&D uh, observatory at the World Health Organization. Um, it was uh, agreement on starting at least demonstration projects, so more small-scale pilots uh, and startup projects which could utilize uh, the, the recommendations and principles uh, recommended by CWG, and then to further explore coordination mechanisms and financing mechanisms uh, uh, through work at the Secretariat in WHO. Uh, in 2014, uh, the demonstration pro projects were more or less agreed to uh, at least the process of how to define them and uh, how to solicit them. Um, and there were further kind of uh, calls for uh, going into the funding mechanisms and is potentially establishing uh, pooled funding mechanisms with voluntary contributions from governments. And finally this year, uh, 2015, um, there is now a recommendation from the Secretariat to the governing bodies of WHO. Uh, the, the, the observatory is being established, the coordination mechanisms and the pooled fund is suggested to be established uh, at the TDR, but in close collaboration with, uh, with WHO. And this is now up for consideration at the World Health Assembly. I would just briefly say something about the, about the observation, no, no, the demonstration projects. Um, those demonstration projects were really selected based on submission, I guess, of, of 23 projects in total. Um, there was uh, developed a set of criteria uh, decided on uh, by the World Health Assembly. Um, and were many, in many ways, those criteria were based on the recommendations of the CEWG, uh, and they are listed here. So uh, tot in, after a couple of processes, we have now a set of five demonstration projects that have been kind of meeting these criteria and have been approved by the governing bodies to go forward. The challenge, and this is my final kind of slides then, the ch challenge is really how do we finance them then? There was some estimations that the funding these would need $60 million. Not much. This, the CEWG called for increased investments by $3 billion in, in this space. Uh, and so what we did is that if we took the recommendation of the CWG, which really called for a uh, proportional <coughs> contribution from countries based on their economic means and power, how would this kind of uh, then be shared, the financial cost between countries? And I just very briefly, high income countries would of course, because they are high income countries, uh, they would need to pay the most, but we also would need funding from upper middle income countries and lower middle income countries. Uh, if you divide it by regions, it demonstrates that all regions would need to contribute, all regions of WHO. Uh, the three biggest would be the Americas, the European region and the Western Pacific region. Also partly because of course, high income countries driving the economic size of those regions. And then finally, if you look at kind of big economic groupings and you say Euro US, Europe and the BRICS and then divide the, the, the rest of the world, um, you see that the three kind of big economies in the, in the sense of combining European region, the USA and BRICS, they must kind of contribute almost, and the BRICS and the US almost at the same level if we follow the recommendations. So we did this just to indicate that if we really need to can solve these problems, if we are going forward with it, we need um, all countries to contribute, irrespective of their economic needs. Thank you.
Thank you, Yana. And we'll, we're going to swing back to, to talk a little bit more about the CEWG and, and where we are now and moving forward. But I want to switch gears a little bit and um, turn to George um, as the PDP representative on the panel. Product, PDPs or Product Development Partnerships were, were established to accelerate global health R&D and, and really contribute to global health R&D writ large. Um, and I, I'd love to hear how access fit into, fits into the PDP approach um, and what would be a worst case scenario of developing a new product but actually not planning for access or not planning early enough on to actually, you know, make sure that there aren't lags and delays in getting a new product out. Um, so thanks, Claire, for the question, and thanks for the chance to participate in this panel. Um, MMB is, as you said, a product development partnership. We are focused on the development of malaria medicines, whether they're treatments or chemo prevention agents. Um, and Truthfully, MMB's trajectory in the first, it's now just past its 15th anniversary, the first six, seven years of its life actually were kind of access agnostic, I would say is the most kind way to put it. There was no access visibility or function within MMB in those early years. And I would say that was a function of two things. Um, in part, the novelty of PDPs in 1999, 2000 was such that what was the right role and the roadmap for a PDP to play from early stage drug discovery, drug development, launch, and post-launch. It wasn't clear. We were all kind of figuring out as we went along what the roles of PDP should be. We were clear about identifying new targets. Life after regulatory approval was somewhat unknown. There was a default belief amongst many people in the community that there were existing entities on the ground who were quick qualified and capable of taking new technologies and introducing them. Thus, there wasn't a real role for PDPs to be interacting on the access side. This is about 2000 to 2006 I'm describing. I think there was a change in our mind and some of our donors' minds about the role that PDPs could play in providing an assurance level that drugs that were actually heading towards a successful regulatory approval actually would have a lot of forward thinking around key considerations about the key questions of access to medicines. <coughs> Could we guarantee the drugs would be widely available? Could we guarantee the drugs would be affordable? Would they be acceptable? Because affordability and availability doesn't necessarily mean acceptability. And so at this time, as we were three years away in our own case from uh, our partner and our drug coming to market in 2009, MMV began to take this much more seriously. The question of, is it enough to say we have a pharma partner that's committed? Is it enough to say that there are players in the field who know the realities of malaria endemic countries and thus we should just sit back? And the answer was no. We actually need to have a catalytic role in that. So if you'll permit me uh, just, a, just a couple of quick slides um, that will let me speak to a case example, case study. Right. So this might seem a little pat or a little simplistic, but I do think the underlying belief here is what drove our board and some of our key stakeholders to push us towards access. That statement that says, the journey from molecule to medicine is not a seamless one and that we actually believe that starting from the left in a test tube, you don't actually have a medicine to speak of until you are delivering it to those who need it. So a medicine on a shelf is not a medicine, is the negative way to put it. A medicine in a patient's mouth is a medicine. So if we were truly to stand up and say, we're a partnership about making new medicines, we had to have a significant commitment around delivery. So this is a bit of a dry slide. Normally it takes me 10 minutes to describe it, so I'm going to pass quickly over the key concepts here. This is our map, MMV's internal map of what I call the lily pads that you have to hop across to get to the right side, which is patient access. It's our analytic model. It's like several other people's ideas about what it means to create access to medicines. But these are the steps that we think happen after you've successfully identified a new candidate compound. So imagine a molecule that goes into phase one and phase two. It's looking great. 
strong phase three results, then this lily pad hopping starts. The questions that have to be asked in the product development itself, have we been thinking about the ultimate destination, the ultimate user group? So in product development, on the left side of this screen, the guiding light for product development in MMV and other partnerships should be tied to target product profiles. That's kind of holding yourself up to how the people in the field who need these drugs will interact with them, how you're going to be honest and stick to a product target. So that guides a lot of the left side. The regulatory approval, product readiness, policy financing, distribution and delivery are the key questions that have to be answered once you're anticipating a stamp from WHO prequalification, Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., any stringent regulator. Once you picture that in the pocket, you have to have started to grapple with these other questions about approvals and use in the country. And so let me just give you an example of a drug where the question you brought, what would happen, worst case, if this weren't delivered, we went through an analysis about any one of these falling down and how, in fact, it would have a devastating impact. The drug in question is um, injectable artesanate. Full disclosure, MMV did not identify injected artesanate as a uh, early stage discovery. Artesanate is a known, it's a known entity, it's a known chemical entity of great value for malaria. Its use in treating severely ill patients with malaria was not widely, um, was not widely accepted for several years, even though early stage evidence was injections of artesanate can save lives very effectively. It wasn't yet in the pocket. It wasn't yet in the marketplace for three of the key reasons that are up there. And let me just quickly describe the <laughs> obstacles that injectable artesanate faced. First, in terms of the policy and acceptance of injected artesanate as a life-saving intervention for people with severe malaria. The problem was that the regulatory entity that was chosen to give an approval, or this quasi-regulatory entity, WHO, pre-qualification, did not have enough of an evidence base in African patients. So up to 2007, it was accepted for use in Asians. There wasn't enough evidence about its use in African children. And the policy, consequently, of advocating the use of this drug, in essence, was over a barrel for an additional four years. I would say this was an acutely frustrating time for those of us who knew our testament was a life-saving drug. But to check off the box of the required evaluation of patients in African malaria endemic countries was not adequate then, couldn't give it this strong policy, regulatory, uh, strong policy push. And consequently, prequalification only responds to what it's told to look at as a priority drug. So that was a really difficult time. Things changed really beautifully in 2000, uh, end of 2010, when we had four things converge. Number one, the result of African trials in children. Number two, WHO pre-qualification working really quickly thereafter to uh, uh, evaluate a manufacturer and pre-qualify their product. Three, the standard treatment guidelines at WHO were modified within three months to recommend the widespread use of the drug. And then lastly, thanks to, um, I'll pat you on the shoulder because it was MSF that really jumped out first with a very nice, I would call this historically one of the better medical advocacy things that we've seen in the malaria space, a great evidence-based but charismatic, pushy advocacy paper called Making the Change. Mm. And, it, it, and this helped MMV catalyze many other stakeholders along with MSF and WHO around a table or tables to talk about, look, we've got those other ducks lined up now. Now we have to make sure this thing moves as quickly as we want it to. And the MSF document went through the evidence, what the costs would be, how the cost effectiveness could be considered. And with those things in place, you really begin to construct a battering ram where the policy engagement at country levels becomes much, much easier. Because you're beginning to talk to countries that ultimately are the decision makers, right? It's national autonomy. They will make the decision about how they will or won't accommodate this new recommended therapy. When you can go into those discussions with pre-qual, standard treatment guidelines, strong economic arguments, 
and a beautiful evidence base about why there's a huge value to making the change. The change, by the way, was injected quinine was the standard course of treatment before we had this leap into the uh, injected artesanate space, making the switch from quinine to artesanate. And, um, and around this time, 2011 and 12 and 13, it was country engagement. How, what do you need to change policy? What are the questions you have <coughs> nationally that really starts to stir the pot? And it's not a single answer. This means talking to 20 and 30 countries to see what they're actually contemplating doing. And when one of the bottlenecks became evident that it was about money, so unit for unit, a quinine vial versus an injected artesanate vial have about a six, seven X delta. Artesanate's about seven times more expensive. Um, this, for nice, lack of a nicer term, freaked out countries that they had never had to worry about paying for quinine and now they had a significantly more expensive intervention and how are they gonna finance this and would this have to become part of their global fund requests or request to President's malaria initiative? And so money mattered. And the recognition that money mattered led MMV and other partners to start looking for a platform through which new monies could be brought to this intervention. Um, and around 2012, uh, August 2012, MMV and partners submitted a proposal to Unitaid um, to say, help us do three important things. One, get six countries that have a high burden into this game immediately by bypassing their global fund grant waiting processes to start as quickly as possible getting injectable artesanate into their national systems. They had to be willing countries, they had to have made the policy change, but we needed, we needed some money in the machinery to get the drugs into these countries quickly. So first request to Unitaid, fund that. Secondly, help us diversify the marketplace. There was, as I mentioned, 2010, one pre-qualified manufacturer. And sadly, I hate to say it, but today we're still in that place. So we're five years out and we're still dealing with just one. But the point of this grant from Unitaid was diversify the marketplace. And we and partners are in the middle of bringing in additional manufacturers, we hope, in the next few months. So diversify the supply side. And then lastly, through your work in countries, your examples learned from the six should be replicable, instructive to other countries such that at the end of the day, the money serves a catalytic purpose <coughs> of stimulating demand and removing policy concerns and evidence barriers at other national levels. So by the time you step away from this kind of an intervention, you should see a much more vibrant, mature, competitive marketplace for this kind of uh, a commodity. So that's more or less the case story of injectable artesanate. It's not done yet. We're halfway through this grant process. The countries are now starting to use this drug very nicely. And not just the six countries that we in Unitaid focused on, other countries have started to adopt this nicely since 2013. But we still need to diversify the marketplace. We certainly want to see a better price over time because we think it could be more affordable. And these are the things that will have to be ironed out. But let me just step back for a second and quote from the MSF document. You said, what would be the impact if you have a great new intervention and no one uses it? This is really stark. For severe malaria, so roughly, you have 600,000 deaths a year, a little under now, but roughly 600,000 deaths per year from malaria. You have about 8 to 12 million cases of severe malaria per year. Quinine versus artesanate is a radical difference in the mortality. So 22% less children would die from uh, severe malaria if they could be treated with artesanate versus quinine. 37% of adults in Asia benefited from artesanate versus quinine. So if you looked at every single one of those sick patients about, or hopefully, if you look at patients who are at risk of dying and said, I've got quinine or I've got artesanate, what's the difference? As MSF pointed out, about 200,000 lives per year. That's where you get out of bed every morning and say, this is why we care. This is why we jump over these lily pads because it does mean more lives will be saved through better technologies. Great, thank you, George. That's actually a really great setup, I think, for um, my next question. I'm gonna jump over Manica, go to go to Denis uh, for a moment and then go back to Manica. George, you know, I'm sorry, Denis, CIPLA is the largest supplier of ARVs for low and middle income countries. And, and I'm wondering, just taking what, 
what George was just saying about the need to, you know, why do we do this and thinking about those numbers, those 200,000 people, you know, how does industry balance the expectations <coughs> of your shareholders who, for, you know, who are expecting profits and maximizing the profits and then and, and balance that with the responsibility of ensuring that the products that are being developed are not only acceptable, are not only affordable, you know, but are accessible to those who are actually least likely to be able to pay? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Thanks, Claire. Uh, just I, to, to my great sorrow, I must say, CIPLA is not the largest. They are the... Uh, oh, you're <laughs> no, we're number two after Milan. Uh, but that's trying to, to get better. <laughs> Aspirational. <laughs> so I, I am an advocate, so we Thank aspire. You. Uh, you know, the, the, the question you, you ask, and I, I can answer how our shareholders are thinking about it, but I think it's important when you're looking at what is the, the position of industry on R&D, you see that you really have different types of, of pharmaceutical industry. And uh, what is called uh, uh, research-based uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies and generic companies do not work in the same way. Uh, a research-based organization will try to discover new molecules or buy them from a, from a research uh, organization, a university, etc., and then, and then develop them uh, uh, from, from beginning to end, getting uh, to, uh, into as, as solid a, a patent network as possible, working through a monopoly, and then trying to get uh, the best possible return uh, on, on their uh, on their investment, uh, including on the investment that has failed. So, uh, of course, they, they, they go into high prices. And these high prices are generally uh, targeted towards the, the countries that can pay these high prices. So, hence, uh, there has been a dearth of, of research for the diseases of the poor just because it, was, it did not correspond uh, to the model. And, and this is why PDPs and, and others were created. So, the, the way they are looking at, at access is access for those who can pay to uh, products that are priced at a level which are going to, which is, you know, prices which are at a level, allowing them to, to recoup their, their R&D cost and, and profits as well. Whereas the generics, uh, generic companies have uh, uh, quite a lot of R&D, but not at all in the same way. Uh, when you're a generic company, the first thing is, by definition, you don't have a monopoly. You are in a, in a competitive environment. Uh, in a sense, the price, at least the ceiling price is fixed. You try to get to a lower price in the competition, uh, but uh, you cannot be more expensive than your competitors because then you don't have a market. So uh, it's not trying to get as high a price as possible. It's trying to, to get a margin which remains as tolerable as possible with a price which is, which is uh, not that negotiable. It's cutthroat competition, and there is no IP, uh, by definition, from the generics. The R&D of generic companies uh, for a long time has been on the, on the chemistry. How can we make uh, the same drug, but with cheaper uh, raw material, what you call EPI, <coughs> uh, with uh, better uh, chemistry, you know, which uh, saves money, how to, to make them less costly? Uh, and it's something that uh, the, the generic companies are very good at. Uh, I remember discussing with the people of, of Gilead about tenofovir. And when, when they arrived at their, what they call the humanitarian price or whatever, they were absolutely convinced it was impossible to go lower than it. And uh, uh, over six years, I mean, the generic companies have divided it by three. So uh, it's, it's just a different type of, of research, a different type of, of talent. What we're seeing now is more and more involvement of generic companies in the development of, of products, getting into new forms. I mean, in, in the case of CIPLA, for instance, we have been very involved in the pediatric forms for antiretrovirals that no one uh, was working on. Uh, we're developing uh, new uh, anti-TB drugs. We're not discovering them, but going into the development, uh, which means also the clinical trials, which are also a whole lot of things that generic companies didn't do uh, in the past. So although I was showing a picture of two very different type of jobs, it's actually some elements of convergence as you have large uh, companies, uh, innovating companies, which have strong uh, generic arms, uh, think of Sandoz, for instance, on the Swiss side, or uh, you see uh, the generic companies uh, like CIPLA, like, like others, like, like Sun in India, which is the largest generic manufacturer, which are involved into uh, more discovery and development of drugs. So this is one aspect that I think it's important to look at two different models of what is R&D in the industry. When it comes to getting access 
from the results of R&D. Now, we, there is a tendency to look only at the price. Uh, the, the price is an issue, of course, but actually, uh, to us, it's not, it's not a very big issue. Uh, we try to, to get as low a price as possible, but the, 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 there are plenty of other uh, factors. First, quality. Huh? You, um, I'll, I'll give you uh, one example. Some, some of you may have read articles published uh, on the price of drugs uh, by the University of Liverpool, uh, announcing you know, that the price of some products should be extremely low. And I remember reading about a price of Antecavir, uh, which would be $35 per year. Uh, right now, with the lowest possible price of API you can find on the market, at a quality which is totally undetermined, it's actually uh, the API only costs $54. So I don't know how they do this calculation. But when you get into quality assured API, the API only costs $400. So the thing is that when you are a, a serious uh, company, generic or not, you try to get only high quality products. And you try to get only uh, an API which is absolutely uh, perfect. I mean, you cannot make good products with bad raw material. So this is one of the issues. <coughs> when you get the best possible raw material, then the price goes up. Now the price will go down when the quantities increase. And the quantities play a huge role as well. Uh, you know, we manufacture uh, the combinations of uh, tenofovir, lamivudine, favirens, uh, et cetera, which are the basic uh, products uh, from, uh, uh, for, for HIV. Uh, we, when we started, 300,000 patients were taking it. Now it's uh, 11 million patients are taking it. Now, of course, the price of, uh, of the API has gone down. We are no longer buying it as well. We are manufacturing it ourselves. We are manufacturing more than 10 tons per month of, of API. Now, we have been able to optimize, etc., and get the price down. But it's, it's something which comes only with a certain size of market and which doesn't apply to some of the rare diseases, and among them the, the neglected diseases, uh, where you don't have that many patients, and when it is difficult to have this, uh, uh, this effect of quantity. Price is important, but it's not only price, it's who pays for it. Um, you know, I know that when Gilead came uh, with a price of $84,000 for the treatment of hepatitis C, everyone said, this how, how terrible and how high this is. Well, definitely it's a high price. Um, but uh, the generic companies, and we have been working hard at it, are arriving at about $450. Now, you know, we say it's incredibly better than 84000 But there is no financing for it. There is no government program apart from Egypt that pays for treatment of hepatitis C. And $450 out of pocket in a low-income country is unaffordable. So it's not because you get a much better price that you are going to get access. And if you didn't have the financing program that went with it, if you didn't have a third party helping to pay for the product, uh, even if, if we increase the quantities, if we work on the API, maybe we will get it to, uh, let's say, $350, but it's still too high uh, for a lot of people who would need access to this treatment. So getting the appropriate financing is also important uh, to get access. One of the main headaches we have as pharmaceutical companies is the bureaucratic obstacles. You get your product, you get your price, and when you come to register it or pre-qualify it, it takes years. It takes between two and three years to get a WHO pre-qualification. It takes about the same amount of time to get a, a product registered in a lot, of, uh, a lot of developing countries. Well, actually, not only developing countries, in, lot, in a lot of countries. And, and very often, uh, th these obstacles are artificial or are made because the registration authorities are not so uh, organized enough, are not so uh, manned uh, properly. And uh, these are major obstacles to access, which are coming from uh, f from a problem which could be resolved uh, probably uh, easily. But uh, it's th this problem of registration becomes a real uh, issue when it comes uh, to access. And you know that when it's registered, then you must have a distribution system that would get the product to the people. Now, uh, I, I was impressed by your slide, which speaks of suppositories. I hope you don't inject them. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, you take uh, artesunate suppositories, for instance, which is one way of administration of artesunate for severe malaria in very young children. Uh, this is in the communities uh, in the countries with uh, endemic malaria. 
uh, in places where you must have the distribution going to the very last, uh, last mile. I mean, the, the, the suppositories must be available at the, with a community health worker or inside the family already, because a severe malaria in a child uh, kills a child very fast, I mean, 48 hours. So having the product available at this uh, you know, level uh, of, uh, uh, you know, of, of periphery is something which requires a distribution system that works. And unfortunately, very often, it is not the case. So we are seeing many governments who procure uh, products, procure them at a low cost because the procurement methods have improved, get them into their central medical stores, sometimes into regional medical stores <coughs> in a regional capital, but then have a lot of difficulties getting them to where the people would need them. And this leads of course, to, uh, to poor treatment. This also leads to a lot of other things, and for chronic diseases such as HIV, you find that a lot of, pati of patients just drop out of treatment. When they have to travel uh, you know, a full day to get to, to their drugs, that they are going to queue for hours, and sometimes there is a stock out, after some time they just stop the treatment. So getting the appropriate distribution is also a major issue of access, regardless uh, of the price. Now, uh, one thing which is clear, not a single pharmaceutical company will sell a product at a loss. And you, when a product is losing money or when your, your, the selling price becomes lower than the price of manufacturing it, you just drop it out and stop making it. And uh, this is one, one element. You, know, you have, have to know where the floor is. And uh, this is one of the things which have become uh, a bit problematic and, and for which the, the Global Fund has, has brought new methods of negotiation which have helped a lot uh, in the last month. Where instead of saying, let's do tenders and try to get the lowest possible price, they say, okay, let's you know, review with you your cost of goods, your cost of manufacturing, etc., and let's try to, to see how you can get it as low as possible and still have a margin. And then, if we are in agreement with that, we are going to give you a long-term order, so, you know, whatever, two years, I think, it's, uh, it's what we get for the moment, so that you can plan your manufacturing, you are not going to have idle capacity, you know that your product will have uptake, so you know that you are not going to lose money. And that's with this type of approach that the prices can indeed go down, provided people don't try to get them lower than, than what is the reality. Now, when you get it lower than, than the costs, what happens is, the people who remain uh, you know, profitable at this cost are those who are cutting corners, those who are getting uh, raw material uh, of, uh, of poor quality, <coughs> those who are not doing all the checks and balances. There is, no, there is no magic. Sometimes you can find a, a new pathway for make, making a molecule, but a product can never be sold less at a price which is less than the, those of the raw material there's uh, always a catch, and the catch is something which is paid dearly by the patient when the quality is not there. So I, I think I've been talking probably too long already. No, <laughs> Please, Claire, back to you. I mean, I think you've, ra you've touched on a lot of topics, which I imagine there's a lot we can circle back to. Um, but I do want to make sure that we do have time for Manika. Um, to talk about uh, Manika Yu, along with Jan Arn and a number of other leading experts recently uh, released a report in PLAS Medicine um, talking about how, you know, calling for the tripling of, of funding for neglected disease research and calling for a number of the, of the recommendations that had been included in the original CEWG report with, with a little more meat on, on the bones. And I'd really love to hear you lay out some of the key principles and proposals um, and how MSF and some of your partners are also thinking of trying to move this campaign forward. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll probably just try to give a, sorry, a, a kind of couple of background slides before um, touching into that. Uh, if you could just put the slides forward. Sorry, it's over. There we go, yeah, that's standing. That's pointed, yeah, right. One more? Yeah, one more. Um, so, uh, just to kind of uh, summarize the general problematic, uh, and really also touch on, on some of the issues around um, research development uh, and access. Um, and I mean, broadly speaking, I, we normally talk about innovation, looking at innovation and access together. But I think there's a lot, when you look specifically around research and development, uh, particularly for biomedical <laughs> tools, there's, there's 
I think several issues that we need to bear in mind that is part of the broader problematic, especially when we start looking at uh, how we need to think about the future. Um, first of all, just an obvious comment to say that market failure is still a problem um, and we are still seeing uh, our needs, uh, our needs uh, in R&D wear and clear gaps. Um, and often it, this is kind of very particular also to having R&D that is ad adapted to resource limited settings um, and that is also affordable. Um, we do think that maybe we need to think about R&D in a different way, specifically when you look at li limited resources, uh, areas of market failure and look, propose a model that's more uh, geared towards collaboration rather than competition. Um, there are other issues at stake, particularly in the process of doing R&D. Um, you have to think about risk benefit and contextualize it uh, rather than taking a very uh, general perspective. Um, it is, of course, and very important to do ethical and feasible trials. Uh, and I think what is key here is also looking at capacity at country level. Um, far too much uh, research uh, is really not owned by, I think, local researchers. Um, this also goes into the issue of uh, a, spin, a, a kind of side part of R&D, which is also around how biological samples are handled. Uh, and I think particularly the issue around Ebola, there was a lot of, uh, a, a lot of questions around this. Uh, and I think also looking at, at, at what Denny mentioned, regulatory issues at country level, because this is quite complex. This is also the capacity doing innovation at the country level. What is the capacity of the regulator also to provide clinical trial applications to monitor and audit what is happening on the ground, plus the process of you know, uh, registering products, often new products uh, in, in developing countries. So there are real challenges uh, around the innovation side, but of course also in the enforcement side as well. Uh, and then looking uh, at post-trial access. So, you know, um, we, we don't talk about cost here. I'm talking about the broader issues that uh, I think the other panel members have uh, mentioned. Um, I just would like to say uh, probably a quick word around uh, target product profiles. Um, because I think one of the issues that we t when we talk about R&D is that we look at needs-driven R&D. And I think it's extremely important to look at what are the things that can really help you in terms of defining needs. Uh, and uh, a lot of the R&D that we see are often not generally ad uh, adapted or kind of ideally adapted to what, we, what the situation is on the ground. Um, so when you think about TPP, it's, it's a complex process and people often just think, well, let's, why don't you just have a, uh, an oral tablet once only, you know, at uh, one cent. Well, that's not how you do TPPs. Um, it's not in just an aspirational process. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, particularly when you, there is a lack of commercial in incentives and limited resources, we really need to think about TPPs carefully. Um, but TPPs are important because they can help us determine priorities and focus resources. They can highlight specific nuances around disease epidemiology or specific population needs that are often not taken into account. Uh, and I think what this does requires to bring researchers and implementers together often uh, at certain levels to, to, I think, really exchange information. We've certainly seen in the field of neglected diseases where I've come from uh, and from my R&D background that this has been absolutely critical. And certainly in practice, I mean, if I'm looking back in the last 12 months, um, you know, TPPs have been very useful in helping us to guide uh, in a very short space of time how we want to move forward uh, in an area like, uh, like in Ebola, for instance, when we looked at Ebola diagnostics, one of the first things we did was define some TPPs as well as doing a landscaping, then identifying technologies that we could rapidly accelerate and start implementing in the field. And I think we are starting to see some outputs of that. Um, so I, I would actually make a very strong case to say that uh, um, this is something that really should be uh, taken very seriously. Now, looking at cost and access is a very specific issue. Um, uh, I just would like to say um, that uh, we generally have to look at this in a holistic picture. So, of course, what Denny said that, um, you know, uh, the cost of a product uh, or I would say the price of a product is not the only factor in play. Um, however, it can be a barrier for, in, for innovation. And you mentioned the issue around hepatitis C. It is true that we need to also find, uh, you know, the ability to pay. Um, but you cannot have this discussion when you look at ridiculous prices of a product. You just cannot even enter into a political discussion here. So it does make a difference when I think generic companies are sending strong signals that you can start having actually a normal <laughs> conversation about uh, and then having a, a discussion at, at, at a policy level and for uh, decision makers to make choices. 
Um, so when it's not, you know 80,000 or whatever, there's no choice to make. Um, so it's a process that will take time, um, but I think it, it's to also say that you cannot then marginalize the issue of the cost of a product or price of a product. Um, I'd say the lack of transparency is an issue. Um, we often hear that R&D is expensive. Well, yes, it is. I, I've done R&D. I've done clinical trials. Um, but uh, it's very variable. It really depends on what, you, what kind of disease you're doing, uh, looking at and what kind of R&D you're doing, what kind of technology you're looking at. Um, but, of course, when there's no transparency in the cost in R&D, then you can take anyone's word for how much it costs. Uh, and then there's an additional factor on who has paid for it. Uh, because there's a huge amount of public investment in R&D, and we should not forget this. As John Anna has already pointed out, in our current business model, we already provide uh, something between 30 and 40 percent public funding to R&D, and if you look in areas like HIV or TB, uh, this is considerably more. Um, so we have to take into the account that at times we are paying twice for this. Um, a lot of innovator companies, if you look at the issue of Savospivir, uh, this is not a company that has developed it from start to finish. This is a, this is a company that's done a business transaction, acquired a product, uh, and then priced the product according to what it thinks the market can pay. So in, when you talk about um, how, how are things priced, is it priced on the cost of the R&D? No, not really. If you look at what are the total uh, overheads of a company in terms of R&D, it's variable, but it is certainly not the all-consuming figure. Uh, and um, therefore, essentially, I think, my opinion is that companies are, are really looking at what they think the market can pay. Uh, I think it works different, of course, with the generic model. I'm talking here specifically around innovators. But I think the problem here is that this, when you look at this from this assumption, it ignores populations that don't present a market. Uh, and it also can underestimate the realities and pressures of healthcare spending and what ministries of health are facing. So we are a medical organization. We work in 70 countries. Uh, we pretty much cover the whole gamut of diseases that we face in, on the ground. And we have to make very difficult choices. Do we put our money here or here? Uh, and, you know, we are a relatively well-financed organization. How does a cash trap Ministry of Health make these decisions? So I think there needs to be a bit of a reality check as well, uh, um, as well as a realization that there is also a bottom to the market as well. Um, now, how do, we, how do we judge this? I think this is going to be, uh, I think, a big question for the future. I think a growing issue, of course, is the role of WHO, uh, the need to, uh, uh, need to ensure that we maintain, uh, so WHO in terms of coordination of R&D, something that John Anna mentioned, but also the need to push uh, uh, and maintain um, FRIX flexibilities. I mean, we are seeing a, a lot of things changing in, in terms of the policy landscape with uh, big um, trade agreements coming into play. And we don't know whether some of the guarantees that we've had um, uh, in terms of TRIPS flexibilities are things that are going to survive in the future. And what this will mean for companies like CIPLA in the future, I think, is a very big question uh, as well. Uh, we as an, a medical organization have heavily relied on um, generic companies uh, to play a part in ensuring access to uh, important medical products. So I'll just um, go to uh, just uh, on, on some kind of general suggestions linking then to the question that you've asked. Um, I think there's several things that we need to, to think about. Um, let's talk about the post-CWG era um, because as John Anna mentioned, this was clearly something that was welcome but hasn't gained a huge amount of political traction. Um, now whether th thinking has changed o over the events of the last 12 months, it's difficult to say. Um, but I do think that we are still not really connecting the dots, so to speak, which was essentially the thrust of this article that we published. Um, as a medical organization, we've seen these issues around market failure in innovation and the cost it has on human life repeatedly in the last uh, decades. Uh, and for us, it's, this is just a repeated pattern. After a while, it gets boring to actually talk about this. Um, but we have to talk about it because it's an important that policymakers will also understand um, the human cost to this. But I think Ebola was uh, yet another, you know, tragic example in, I think, you know, a series of issues we have on how we, um, you know, kind of drive needs-driven R&D, uh, particularly where there are gaps, particularly when you look at diseases where there's market failure. Um, so I think one of the first things we have to think about is, uh, as, as already mentioned by the Global Observatory, but thinking about priority setting. What are the priorities? What is being spent? Uh, on what? Uh, where are the gaps? Uh, and marrying, marrying the issue around all the different flows of financing on R&D with 
um, the public health needs and determining where those, the, the residual gaps are. Because R&D is a long-term process. You need to think about this in 10, 20 year perspective. Um, I think there clearly needs to be greater coordination between funders, but funders need information to coordinate. And so this is where I think the issue around having an observatory and looking at priority setting is key. Uh, I think the role of organizations like WHO and um, TDR are very important. Uh, I think that uh, both have actually played a very important role in the last um, couple of decades in this issue. Um, I think we shouldn't minimize the contribution that's been made already uh, by both these organizations. And I think they have a mandate and a platform uh, for member states to discuss these uh, at a policy level. So uh, I clearly see a continuation of these organizations uh, in this. Um, then I would actually advocate on something that I think is often forgotten, which is the need for research platforms. And this has become very topical now when we've talked about Ebola recently. Um, should we have a research platform for in the more emergency settings for emerging infectious diseases outbreaks? But in fact, we've seen um, such platforms be very successful in other diseases. And maybe what we need to think of is stop siloing also the capacity we have on the ground in HIV or TB or neglected diseases and start sharing this capacity uh, uh, in, when we are doing, when we are in the research process. And um, uh, research, you know, R&D is a process. It's not a disease speciality. There are nuances that each disease brings. Um, but, you know, having worked in, in clinical trials in three or four different areas, I can actually say there's a lot to be gained by now thinking about this, uh, about this level of sharing capacity. Now, what this does require is greater endemic country involvement and actually in many ways increased funding and commitment from these countries. This is an investment uh, for these countries and they should really see it in a positive sense. It's not a, a drag that they have to spend more money in this. This will pay itself off very quickly. Uh, and I think it also is a, it's a great way of investing in a country's, uh, country's future. But there are very strategic reasons because, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to guarantee that your needs are met, you have to, have to put some money on the table. Uh, and I think one additional way of managing this is also to look at a pooled R&D fund and alternative models of funding, uh, of incentivizing R&D. So this takes us really to the next slide, which is a kind of post-CWG kind of slide. Uh, and, and to really look at bio, global biomedical R&D funding and a, and a mechanism. And the way that we see it is, let's try to at least connect the dots of the current priorities we have on the table. People are talking about this AMR crisis uh, and, you know, the, 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 the era of when, you know, antibiotics won't work anymore. I mean, you can easily fold in uh, any infectious disease when you talk about AMR. Uh, so you can look at easily, uh, you know, TB, for instance, a lot of parasitic diseases as well as uh, bacterial infections. But this is commonly used for, for bacterial infections. Nonetheless, uh, there's a clear recognition that there is a serious concerted effort needed um, to meet, uh, uh, I think, the innovation gap here. <coughs> then there's the issue around emerging infectious diseases. Ebola is obviously one of them, but there, there are many different pathogens that can be pose serious health uh, risks and, and uh, health security risks in the future. And the third bucket of work, of course, is um, um, neglected diseases. Um, people often refer to Ebola as a neglected diseases, but officially it's not on the WHO list of NTD, so it's important to differentiate these things uh, clearly. Um, but we've, we've already kind of identified, even within these three areas, there's a lot of overlap, scientific overlap, potentially, you know, uh, molecules, for instance, that may have activities in more than one area. So maybe we need to join this up a little bit uh, and then think about different concepts such as delinkage, open innovation, um, licensing for access. Uh, and uh, all of this can come under uh, looking at one pooled global R&D fund. Now, I think realistically speaking, you're not going to fund every single disease or problem in these three different areas. I think clearly what is important is to prioritize what are the acute needs, and we have to start from there. Because any a fund that is created, uh, whether it's voluntary or mandatory, the funding is going to be limited already from the start. Uh, and we have to see this model complementary to uh, the left-hand side of the slide, all the additional um, funders uh, that are potentially out there, uh, big ones as well as country funders. Uh, and this is where the element of uh, um, the global observatory, the monitoring uh, and the coordination becomes extremely important. So this is just trying to put all of this together. I know it's a repetition of uh, a lot of the uh, CWG discussions, but these discussions all happened for a reason. Uh, and we have to go back and think about some of these issues now that we've been through a crisis that has actually been extremely traumatic for, for you know, the people of West Africa and think of the future public health implications here. Can we really afford to, to fail again? 
Um, I will close by just talking about one particular example of what we had envisaged for an example like TB, where we, we are seeing some degree of innovation happening, two new uh, chemical entities provisionally registered for tuberculosis, but incredibly, these two new drugs never been tested before. Uh, we have no clue now how we would use these drugs together uh, on the ground, and so additional research is needed. Uh, and additionally, um, we are currently moving towards uh, essentially donation models for both of these drugs. Um, there is uh, issues around uh, access at country level, uh, issues around some of the regulatory issues that, that Denny mentioned. Uh, and, and, and I think it, it's really quite messy when you look at something like TB, where the pipeline overall is very anemic. So um, we're already shooting ourselves in the foot before we start, uh, which is great. Uh, but I think what we, need to, what we now need to think is what kind of model can we look at um, that can really kind of optimize the way we are working, even with limited resources. And what we've, we've looked here is to look at um, looking, uh, pulling together what Yonan had mentioned, looking at what we call push-pull and pool mechanisms. So um, let's look at the traditional push funding. Uh, where is it that are the gaps in TB R&D? And often in the translational space, there's a major gap. Uh, when we look at pool funding, the current pool funding mechanism of uh, monopolies and high prices, in, this is clearly not going to work because it's an area of market failure. So are there alternative um, pool incentives we can look at, like such as milestone payment or prizes, end stage prizes, uh, and even potentially uh, marketing commitments as well? Uh, and then I think the last element, of course, is on, on the pooling. And we do believe something like uh, a patent pool uh, can be extremely useful. Looking at it differently to how the current patent pool works, <laughs> Uh, taking maybe a little bit more of an upstream step, like potentially how it's currently working uh, in pediatric HIV, uh, and, and, and thinking whether we can find a way to bring uh, you know, innovators, generic manufacturers together uh, at, at, at an earlier stage and, and finding a more collaborative approach to R&D, sharing technology and licensing, uh, and therefore optimizing the developing of combination regimens. So I won't go into it in, in too much detail, but to, to, think, to say that, a lot of policy thinking has already happened. We've, as Jonan had mentioned, more than a decade worth. The answers are all out there. Let's not waste our time kind of rehashing the same thing. Um, we, we keep going through one public health problem and one public health crisis after another. Uh, and it's really time for us to take a step back and now think about, right, how are we moving forward? What, how, what can we practically do to implement key parts of this? And that's really, I think, the essence, uh, to finish off, the essence of the editorial that we uh, that we put in, in, in PLOS, really to say, why can't we just start things? Let's look at a pooled R&D fund. Let's already, we've already identified a few key priorities. Within that, we can identify priorities within the priorities. This fund can basically fund a range of different actors, including entities like, you know, that are currently working, say, on malaria, for instance, or neglected diseases. But they can also fund initiatives that can be set up for uh, AMR that wants to look not at just at R&D, but also for conservation. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, we're not, we, we need to be uh, honest with ourselves on how much money we can put together on this, but actually I think the level of ambition required needs to be big uh, and not small. And then I had a quick follow-up question for you. Understanding, as you say, like we can't do all things for all right away, right? We have to, we have to think longer-term prospect. But in a lot of these discussions where what I hear missing sometimes is what about those global health technologies that aren't, that aren't aimed at neglected diseases, but are aimed at significant unmet acute needs like unmet family planning, mm. which, which do have a different model. They might have a market, some kind of commercial market. Well, they, they certainly have a, some kind of commercial market. And, and I'm wondering how, in your thinking, and, and from a, a post-CEWG era thinking, where do um, technologies and R&D around um, issues like that fit into this broader framework? Do you want me to ask that yeah, I, I, I throw it out to the two of you, but welcome, Denny or George, to, to also address. Uh, uh, well, just to give the example of hepatitis C, there clearly is a market for hepatitis C. We wouldn't have seen all this innovation happening. But we have now a big issue around access. Uh, and that's why I've always said innovation to me is the, 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 the invention and the access to that invention. Uh, that's, to me, the complete picture of innovation. And if you look at a different dictionary definition of innovation, <laughs> pretty much says something along those lines. So, you know, whether there's a market or not, if we are talking about how we manage innovation, we need to integrate those elements together. Uh, and, and a lot of the time, there are, there are different elements at play. I mean, don't get me wrong, although I'm trying to 
uh, pushed all of this, these issues forward. There are clearly issues also about you know, health systems and the strength of health systems and, what, and the capacity of health systems to pay. Um, and, and a lot of the things that we have neglected in the past clearly around systems issue rather than just around commodities. So we should be careful because if we want commodities to work, we also need some forms of systems there to make those commodities arrive at the, right, at, at the patient's doorstep or the user's doorstep. So I think that's, that's you know, for me, the fundamental issue. There are some areas where you have really clear market failure, some areas where you have to uh, create the demand, and they, but there can be a market. And I think there are different interventions at play that can be, uh, that can be used. So just to follow up on that, so the, the Dolwich Out process, uh, at least the R&D part of that, has re is really focusing on, on the need for new inventions and not the innovation in the sense that it, it looks first and foremost on how needs-based innovations and would include, it's, so it was not kind of, kind of scoped only by neglected diseases, it's, it's by all needs that are in markets with insufficient purchasing power. So family planning, uh, devices, technologies, medicines that are kind of uh, put to work in a different setting than the, the high income country setting would definitely fit within that. Uh, so in that sense, I think we have thought through all of those issues and I think we have them on the, on the drawing board and the table and it's, it's really about implementing those issues. Um, I fully agree with Monica that the, the real innovation is really about change and change in the, in the system and, and change in that actually people get access as well. The R&D process at WHO have not revisited those issues. And to be honest, I think there may also be a need for uh, a more high level policy process or actually revisiting what are the policy measures we have at hand for securing real innovations, meaning access to those in need. Because we see that now for the hepatitis C case, uh, and that can turn into uh, another kind of antiretroviral or AIDS kind of case in a sense. And I, of course, we're not there, but we are not really prepared for, um, uh, and we don't have agreement from the principles and the thinking among uh, neither governments or industry partners on how we actually avoid those situations. Uh, and I think that may need uh, revisiting, but that's a different agenda than the, what need to make the inventions come at least to, to approval. So we've gotten actually a few questions um, specifically about the role of implementing, um, implementing partners. So not specifically R&D, not coming from necessarily the government, but for international NGOs that are implementing and, um, and what the role in these, in, and international NGOs broadly, what's the role that they play um, in, in mitigating risk in, and potentially contributing to lower, lower product costs, greater product access. So in essence, what's the role that they play in, um, in, in trying to contribute to facilitating access to uh, glo new global health technologies? Does anyone on the panel want to take this up? I, mean, I, can, I can certainly start. Um, in our experience, um, understanding, being able to work with um, select country, uh, we call them the country implementing partners, um, has been critical to the case study I gave um, and to other work that we do. Uh, in other words, it's not just in the case of a product development partnership, we industry partner and their marketing department and you're done. The, the country contextualization, frankly, the country trusted relationship of in-country partners that have a long legacy of working in the country that are sensitive and catalytic around financing needs, training needs, who can work very well with in-country stakeholders, ministry players, really is important, at least in our domain, for expediting the speed of, of introduction of new, um, of new interventions. In that, I would include, and in just a random sampling of our last three years, MSF, Clinton Foundation's Health Access Initiative, CHI, <coughs> Malaria Consortium, PSI, Save the Children. Now we're, we're looking at inter working with International Federation of Red Crosses. Uh, all of these players, if they do their jobs correctly and they earn their keep, their role can be highly catalytic because they they should be advocating the country's agenda and doing it in a way that makes things move quickly. 
So, I mean, for us, it's a critical role of the CIPs or country implementing partners. And, Medica, were you going to try and address that as well? Um, no, I mean, okay. okay. <laughs> and and I, I, I want to, um, this next question goes to Denise and, and to George. Um, how do you negotiate, it was alluded to, the TPP, George talked about the importance, so as did Manica, of having that T TPP and having access be a part of that from the very beginning. But how do you also continue, how does that TPP you know, evolve over time as we get new clinical data, as, as the landscape shifts and changes, how do we continue to make sure that the access commitments are really first and foremost and are, and are driving the development and, and how are those, from a more technical standpoint, how are you negotiating those access commitments throughout, the, from the beginning and then throughout the R&D process? Because it can be hard sometimes to know what something's going to, what might be the needed access commitments from the beginning when you don't have much clinical data available to you. Happy to, happy to hear you, Susan. Well, you know, in, in the course of, uh, of the development of a product, about anything, uh, anything can happen. Uh, as uh, CIPLA, we have been associating with uh, DNDI for uh, pediatric drugs. There was at some point uh, the idea that uh, we would get uh, uh, you know, sprinkled uh, products that could be, you know, like uh, powder coming on the food for uh, uh, ARVs for children. Actually, it proved to be much more complicated technically than we ever suspected before. So we had to find other forms of doing it in, in the middle of, of the way, because the, the purpose remains the same. You know, we need to have this product for children, and it's what we have set up to, to develop. So we found an, an, a new approach. Then our the new approach, the, the taste was terrible. Uh, we also have to taste the products that, <laughs> that we are testing. Uh, so then after that, we had to get into a, a, a phase of taste masking which is feasible uh, also, but which we had not foreseen at the beginning. So uh, all these things uh, have a life of their own. I mean, it's just, we, we, we cannot know from the beginning it's going to be a straight line. I mean, it, it may happen once in a thousand, but most of the time there are some, some snags and we have to negotiate them as well as possible. Uh, in, in the end, uh, the, the, the price is uh, whatever uh, lowest possible price there is. I mean, it's, uh, and uh, we, are, we are not ever in a position of, uh, of monopoly. Huh? So it means whatever we're developing, every other company can develop as well. And so uh, the, the, the purpose is let's, let's get this product because we, we think there's a need and it, it, is, uh, uh, it is important to develop it. Now after that, of course, I mean, you, you have snacks on the way, but just, it's true for, for any job, I believe. So just two reflections on that. Um, the first part of your question when you were asking about uh, how does a target product profile evolve as new clinical data comes in? It's an interesting question. Ultimately, I, I think of a TPP as anchoring a vision around the way a product should develop. Not aspirational, but the real attributes it should have. Um, in our case, we even talk about TCP, so target candidate uh, profiles, because we're combining drugs normally for a finished product. So first molecule one, then molecule two, and that's the way most of the malaria drugs will be coming out as a combo, right? So even in TCP, um, we try to be rigorous around holding to, we have four different TCPs that we're juggling with, in our case, one for chemo prevention, one for long acting, but it doesn't matter. It could be across any disease space. If you're true to your target compound or target product profile, target candidate profiles, there comes a point in which you may actually have to step away from what was once a promising candidate. We have had that happen in MMV. Yeah. But what I would say is it's much better to be rigorous and loyal to your TCP early on yeah. <laughs> and know when to kill. Yeah. Um, and that, that's something that I think we've come to appreciate more and more with each year. As, our, as we and our partners' early compound libraries grow, not to be hypnotized into trying to <coughs> bend a TCP to something you think maybe would work for the drug, no. So that's one thing is be rigorous to your TPP. As far as the access commitment staying in place as TPPs evolve, then um, in some ways early founding principles when you're talking with a partner need to be clear. So contractually, and I don't like to think that contracts are the only thing that govern our partnerships, but clear contractual commitments around pricing, 
linked to cost structures of a finished product, those need to be really, really nicely ironed out. And I will tell you that currently we're negotiating an agreement with a partner where our legal and BD teams are spending what to outsiders would seem like inordinate amounts of time getting to yes on this, but if we don't do it now, it brings grief later. So y you can and should lock in um, costing commitments and prices related to costing commitments early, so there's clarity. Um, and then in terms of delivery commitments, those can be laid out. It's harder to, to do absolute numbers. You're going to have X thousand patients. That's where you run into the weeds. But you can make commitments around registration in target countries. Um, and you can <laughs> make commitments around you will find other partners if you're unable to meet registration targets. And we have found that that is something that we do make traction with partners, holding them to availability in country um, or, or forcing them to work with other people to do so. Um, as another question we got from the audience was, you know, there are many thousands of actors from the public, private, nonprofit, philanthropic, philanthropic sectors involved in global health R&D. So what do you all envisage as, you know, when you talk about coordination, like what coordination mechanism would you pay attention to? <laughs> we can go down the line. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I guess I'm not an innovator, so in the sense that uh, I'm a trialist and I'm, a, and, I, and I guess I'm a policy person. So, no, I of course there is there is a very competitive landscape uh, um, when it comes to also receiving funding, and I um, and I think what we we have, as the question alluded to, we have many actors in the field. My uh, worry is that. We have a lot of competition for visibility, space, uh, uh, yeah. A lot of work is put into advocacy, visibility efforts, um, going for the hundreds of organizations, going to the same funders or the same set of funders, and that all of that is just kind of uh, front-end work that it never delivers anything, to be honest. It delivers potentially financing in the end that where you can start doing your work. So from a very kind of um, hard line point of view, I think we are wasting resources at that end. Uh, and I would have liked to see stronger coordination among those committed funders uh, in this space, which can uh, reduce the cost related to fundraising, which I think is quite uh, high, actually, when you look into all the efforts of uh, hundreds of organizations. Um, so. And if you can shift those resources then into the real development. Uh, so that would I would see as a one kind of coordination mechanism to actually improve coordination among already committed funders and think about aligning mechanisms for funding and aligning ways you, you actually grant funds to, to PDPs and other uh, partnerships. I think there are efficiencies to, to be gained. Yeah, I mean, I would add that, uh, you know, I agree with what Johanna said and the fact that also there's probably not, you know, thousands of funders who constitute the large majority of money. I mean, we know that money comes, a lot of the money comes from uh, probably a smaller subset of that. So at least some degree of coordination there is going to be very useful. Um, but I, I, I would also make a plea that, you know, from my perspective, you know, sitting and uh, actually as a physician, I would say, all I really care is that at the end of the day, we have something to use for patients on the ground that's going to make a difference. Uh, that's the underlying, you know, ask. Um, but, you know, I do, having worked in this kind of global health space, uh, you know, for some time now, I, I agree with as well that there's a lot of wastage as well, uh, a lot of uh, unnecessary competition. And what is perhaps useful to see is what degree of, of uh, you know, um, coordination has, that has helped. I mean, let's look at also what has been done in the past. I mean, the PDPs are interesting experiments as well in their own right. Uh, I mean, if you look at what the work of MMB as well, what, how, how have you helped that space evolve just in bringing people together, trying to get some kind of prioritization on where you're doing your research and development, helping to pool in the way some of the resources and channeling that to a range of different actors. Um, that will have some success, you know. So I think uh, 
Uh, I think we, we've already been down this road on trying some of these things. We shouldn't forget that. These, these aren't just random words we're using. Uh, so I would like to also make a plea to say that, you know, that, that needs to be thought through. I think the big question, of course, is, you know, um, on, on a wider policy level, this discussion has been happening at WHO. We are currently sitting, you know, uh, during the w World Health Assembly, and I, I clearly think that uh, the continuation <coughs> role of, you know, normative setting agency like WHO, which has also linked to different technical departments, uh, as well as member states, is going to be key. And I think this is where what we need to think things through. And I think I can understand that there is obviously some reluctance sometimes to use these mechanisms that are perceived as slow, but I think we have to take a long-term vision on it. R&D is not to get results tomorrow. If you want to invest you know, R&D today, put money on the table today, you're looking at a long-term, uh, you need to have a long-term vision. And if you let, let's look at a topic like antimicrobial resistance. You have to be thinking of a way of developing new antibiotics, not just for the next 10 years, but for the foreseeable future. This is a long-term vision, and the problem, the biggest problem, I think, is that we don't have any long-term vision in global health. Certainly when it comes from, for, from the innovation space, there's not that many, uh, I think, there's not that many actors I see, really, with the long-term vision. So, so how would you incentivize that long-term that long-term vision. I, I, I'm sorry to say, but this comes. This needs political commitment. It's no one. Politics is about providing a long-term vision. Uh, you know. I, I, you know. That there's no other easy way of saying this. This is not going to be provided by stopgap measures or foundations or whatever. The end of the day is who is responsible for the health of people. As MSF, we are. You know, a <laughs> gap filler. We're coming there. The fire brigade coming to to solve problems happening in different parts of the world. This is clearly, you know, is this really the right way of doing things? We clearly see ourselves having to fill in gaps, but at the end of the day, we are not politically responsible for this. Their political responsibility for the health of populations lies essentially with governments and member states, and they have the ability uh, to actually provide that long-term vision. Uh, and I think that's where it has to come at the end of the day. George, uh, no, something? as a PDP, I'd say that... Um, we have to be very humble in approaching what the priorities are, even in, even in our disease space. Um, two ways I think we try to keep ourselves honest. One, um, the quality of compounds we're looking at specifically have been scrutinized routinely by independent expert scientific advisory committees. The concept's not that novel in the drug space, but in PDPs, I think ESACs, as we call them, and ESAC plays a very important role about um, helping us make sure that we stay focused on winning, potentially winning candidates that will make it through the rigors and to make sure that we don't fall as a PDP in love with a compound. That, But in the, the larger question around what are the global priorities then, in our case, um, honing with tight proximity to WHO, specifically the Global Malaria Program, has been very satisfactory for us. Not always perfect, um, but really important. And so I have to say, exploiting the fact that we're in Geneva. It's brilliant and wonderful to be able to bike across town and sit down with Andrea Bosman, Pedro Alonso, Rob Newman in the past, whatever, right? The, the proximity there is important because the mechanisms that the GMP, the Global Malaria Program, has put in place around expert groups, around advisory committees of their own, the MPAC, really, really helps us keep an eye on uh, the ball. And I'll give you an example of where we missed the ball and it came up later. Um, there's something in the malaria space which is really hot right now. It's called seasonal malaria chemo prevention. It's using two old drugs, frankly, two individual component drugs, which are well, well known and widely used and even failing in some places for cure. But when used in West Africa for prevention, <coughs> they're highly effective in young children. And maybe you never saw this coming as an R&D question. Right? That was found out, SP plus AQ together, would work for chemo prevention, not for cure, but for preventing. That was discovered by researchers in the field from London School and other places. Once it hit the big time, we saw the ASTMH, we tried to figure out if there was a role for us to help on the supply side. But that's okay. We, that's, it's really important that it not be a single organization. Yeah. We do not pretend to have an eye on all the balls moving forward. But to be able to respond and help, I think, is you follow the lead of, in our case, uh, WHO GMP quite carefully. Denise, I'd actually love to see if you have any last 
thoughts that you'd like to share with the group as we get close to the end of our hour and a half together? You know, I, I realized I had not answered your initial question. Is how, how do stockholders uh, react uh, to that? And it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, Supply is true, is, is, is a bit of a, of a, a special uh, company. And uh, the fact that it was the, the company that introduced the, the generic antiretrovirals uh, makes it a, a, a rather original company. Uh, stockholders, they know the, the business model, and the business model is based on, on access. It's based on the principle that what's the point developing drugs if people don't accept them. Uh, so they, they know that 25% uh, of our business is in Africa. They know that uh, uh, one third of our exports are in these uh, products for, for the poor. Um, they know that less than 20% of the turnover is in uh, Europe, Africa, Jap uh, America, Japan, I mean, just in the rich countries. They know also that uh, it's growing more slowly than other companies. And they know also that we're not going to sell the shares to a multinational. So there's, for speculation, it's not really a great company. At the same time, the prices of the stock is very high, uh, and the stockholders stay on board. So does it mean that uh, we have only sales at stockholders? I don't think. <coughs> I think it's, it's actually a, a business model which is sustainable. And, and what's important for us is to see that providing access uh, for the poor is a business, and is a business that, it, that can be successful. It's not a charity. It's not a, a special complex contraption. It's just we can do that as a pharmaceutical business and, and make it successfully. And so there's some kind of note of hope, uh, even if uh, it, it's a bit complicated to get the architecture right. When it comes to developing and making new products at the price people can afford, it is possible to make it within business rules. And Yanard, since you, you kicked us off, I'd like to give you the final word from the panelists. Yeah, no, uh, I, uh, Monica already said that we are in the post-CWD world, and I, I would definitely subscribe to that. I, I hope by the end of the summer that we are in the post-West African Ebola outbreak world. And I hope that the time window between that and when the this, this so-called high-level UN panel, because I'm, I'm relying on that panel to also actually take up the R&D challenges. Not only, of course, look at Ebola as a case, but see that as a disaster that could have been uh, not necessarily avoided, but at least been diminished to, um, to a great extent mm -hmm. if we had taken already at least quite advanced uh, both medicines and vaccines through at least early stage clinical development. Um, and, we be, and we need long-term visions on that, and that's the role of politicians. And fortunately, the panel, at least some of them, are heads of states and, uh, and politicians, and we'd, we'd hopefully with an understanding that we need to deliver on what is, has been on the drawing board for many years in this space. Great. Well, with that, I, I, in closing, I want to thank um, our wonderful panelists here for this really dynamic conversation, which very obvious by the number of questions that are coming in could have gone on for quite a bit longer. And I want to thank our in-person and online audience as well. Um, remember, we will make sure to memorialize all of your questions in the, in the meeting report and hope maybe we'll have a follow-on event to discuss uh, and dig in a little bit deeper into these. Um, if you are interested in re-watching the webinar or you'd like to share it with friends and family, and, um, you can find a video uh, at this link and, or also uh, go to the GHCC website. Um, we'll also, as I said, be providing a report um, and it will be emailed to all of you who've registered um, within the next few weeks. And we do encourage all of our online viewers to um, fill out the evaluation form that will pop up as soon as I'm off the screen. It takes you less than five minutes, and we also encourage our in-person audience to fill out their paper evaluation. They're incredibly helpful in forming any future events and ways that the Global Health Technologies Coalition can provide a platform for sharing these types of ideas and um, just providing a, a, a space for these really vibrant dis and much needed discussions. So thanks again for um, joining us and we hope that you enjoy the day. Thank you.